Ramana Arunachala. One of the great epics is finished, one of the supreme manifestations of divine grace, when God wore a human body and moved and talked with men as Bhagavan Sri Ramana, called Mahashi, the great Rishi. This was no case of an ordinary guru, even though to call any guru ordinary may sound absurd. The guru, if a real spiritual master, is on a higher plane than ordinary mortals. But Bhagavan was not on any plane. He was a man abiding in constant, unwavering consciousness of identity with the self which is God. Or to express the same from the other side, he was God, wearing a human body and submitting to human limitations. For fifty-four years his wearing the body was one long sacrifice for our benefit, and at the end of the sacrifice became a martyrdom. This acceptance of the body with its limitations gave rise to a combination of knowledge with ignorance which puzzled many visitors to Bhagavan. His spiritual knowledge was complete and constant. He spoke always with authority. There was no question of samadhi because he was always in samadhi. He was always consciously atma, the supreme divine, undivided, imperishable self. There was no question of revelation, for who should reveal to whom in a state beyond otherness? Therefore every utterance of his was a divine statement, every explanation a scripture. And yet he showed the same human ignorance as ordinary mortals. He would ask whether so-and-so had arrived, how such-and-such a sick person was faring, and so forth. Many visitors and some devotees found this incongruous and asked how it was that one who had divine knowledge should not know whether a ship had arrived or medicine worked. A devotee puzzled this, asked him once, Does a Niani know everything? And Bhagavan, quick-witted as ever, turned the question from unhelpful theory to a reminder of the sadhana with his reply, Everything worth knowing. This was no case of a yogi struggling up from one state of knowledge to another, but something simpler and immeasurably vaster. It was a man dying to the body and living in absolute identity with the divine self and then accepting simple human limitations. However, it is necessary to be very careful in speaking of such mysteries. One cannot say that the knowledge of any higher state was closed to Bhagavan. He was Bhagavan and no state could be closed to him. Simply that states we call higher had the same illusory, dreamlike reality to him as this human state. He was one with the being that contains and transcends them. When he continued to wear the human form after transcending the human and all other states, he accepted its limitations. To feel heat and cold, to suffer pain and sickness, to be bound by ignorance of events. Had he worn a human body but set himself free from its conditions of pain and sickness and ignorance of events, people would have said, it is easier for him to tell us to abide in the heart unperturbed by events because he has no pain or uncertainty and we have. But he accepted pain and uncertainty as features of the human form and showed that they cannot touch the equanimity of the jnani who remains fixed immovably in the real. This gave force to his teaching since he was but exhorting his devotees to do as he did. Just as Bhagavan accepted the limitations of human knowledge, so did he accept the limitations of human powers. There have been spiritual masters who have worked miracles to exhibit the supremacy of spiritual laws over physical and to show men what a resplendent birthright was theirs for the taking. But the way of Bhagavan was different. It was to show that it is possible to remain fixed in the self, 
amid all the limitations of human life. Therefore, he set an example of submission not only to human suffering and ignorance of events, but even to the laws and conditions of the world in this dark age, laws and conditions which, for him, were reflected in the rules of the ashram authorities. And thus those who found the laws irksome had before them the example of Bhagavan's own submission. However, anything one says about the powers of Bhagavan needs to be as carefully qualified as what one says about his knowledge. There were devotees who looked upon him with simple faith as their father and mother. As the Tamil praise goes, and turned to him in prayer whenever troubles assailed them. Their prayers were answered. Difficulties or sickness passed away, or a favorable issue came about, often at the very moment when a letter on the subject was delivered to Bhagavan or a personal appeal made. When this was not possible or advisable, a spirit of fortitude and submission filled the devotee and carried him through troubles that had seemed overwhelming. Some devotees noticed that Bhagavan might thus respond to prayer, but later when the devotee visited the ashram and told him the whole story and how only an appeal to Bhagavan had finally brought relief, he would seem, at least humanly, to know nothing about it. On one occasion, when asked about this, he replied, As soon as the devotee turns in prayer to the Niyani, the automatic divine activity begins to work. He was giving the explanation in Telugu, but said the words automatic divine activity in English. He never spoke about powers or showed any interest in them, and he discouraged all such interest on the part of his devotees, reminding them that powers are only a distraction on the path to self-realization and that the very conception of powers implies duality. When mention was made of any spiritual master who had performed miracles, he would ask, at the time of performing them, did he think that it was he who was doing it? Often, his compassion worked not in removing misfortunes, but in giving peace in spite of them. A woman, bereaved of her husband, a father, whose only son had died, came and poured out their tale of anguish to him and he said nothing, but simply turned on them his luminous eyes, shining with love and understanding, and peace filled their heart. We, in our materialist age, have been blessed with a ministration comparable only to that of a Buddha, a Christ, a Shankara, and the measure of our materialism is the indifference that our world as a whole has shown. With all its talk of ideals and causes, it has ignored the real blessedness of the age as blindly as the Romans ignored as the Romans ignored Christ. Bhagavan himself said, If there is one Nyani in the world, his influence will benefit the whole world and not only his disciples. However, the teaching of Sri Ramana is by its nature not intended to cause such an upheaval as that of a Buddha or Christ or even Shankara, for he did not come to preach a new religion or to restore an existing one. His work was to open a new spiritual path suited to the conditions of the modern world and accessible to all who turn to him from whatever religion or community they might be. That is to say that it is an appeal not to whole communities, but to those individuals among them who can see their own good and pursue it. The sages agreed long ago that the type of sadhana suited to the Kali Yuga is preeminently Namajapa, the invocation of the divine name. They agreed also that Jnana Marga, the direct path, is too steep a path for the Kali Yuga. However, it was also predicted that the path at the end would be simple and easy to follow. This was brought about by Bhagavan Sri Ramana in opening to mankind the lost path of self-inquiry 
but in a new form suited to the conditions of our age, as will be shown in a later chapter. Indeed, it was a composite, integral path in which all three elements were present, jnana, bhakti, and kanma marga, and more emphasis could be placed according to the nature of the devotee on one or another. It was the creation of this path that was the meaning and the secret of Bhagavan's life among us, and it is this that will be described on one aspect or another in the chapters that follow. Throughout half a century of teaching, he constantly reiterated that this is the best, the most direct, and the surest path. Self-inquiry is the one infallible means, the only direct one, to realize the unconditioned absolute being that you really are. The Quest and the Goal It was shortly before the Second World War that some friends sent me pictures of Bhagavan Sri Ramana and copies of some of his books. Under the influence of the French writer René Gounod, who was reinterpreting forgotten spiritual traditions to the West, I had already understood that all beings manifest the one self or pure being, and that I in my essence am identical with the self. This means that it is possible to realize this supreme identity and become one in very fact, and that the purpose of life is to do so. Until this is achieved, the illusion of separate life in one form or another must continue, and with its sufferings and frustration, obscure the radiance of pure being. I knew that this task was the great heroic quest, the quest of the Sangrail, Holy Grail, and the Golden Fleece, and that it required constant effort on a prescribed path under the guidance of a guru. I was making efforts to find and follow such a path, but people for whom I had the utmost respect had assured me that Bhagavan was not a guru, and that his teaching, however sublime, did not constitute practical guidance on a path that men could follow. I was enormously impressed by the books and pictures, by the spiritual power and beauty in them, but classed them, reluctantly, as a luxury rather than a utility. In any case, I could not have gone to Tiruvannamale because I was at the time a university lecturer in Siam. Soon, however, it became possible. In 1941, I had six months' leave, which I spent in India. And yet, I did not go. I accepted the view impressed upon me that less aspiring effort was more practicable less illumined guidance more effective. In September, when my leave ended, the war was already drawing near to Siam, so I left my wife and three children in India and went back alone. A friend had kindly opened to them his house at Tiruvannamale, the only place where my wife wished to be. She was more concerned with reality than I, less with theory. I went back without seeing Bhagavan. In December, the Japanese invaded Siam, and I was arrested and interned. Just before that, I had received a letter saying that my eldest daughter, then aged five and my son, three years younger, had asked Bhagavan to keep me safe through the war, and he had smiled and assented. There followed three and a half long years of internment until the Japanese surrender in 1945. There was ample time for sadhana. More and more Bhagavan became the support of my strivings, though I did not yet turn to him as to the Guru. As soon as the evacuation could be arranged, I went to Tiruvannamale, arriving there at the beginning of October. And yet, it was as much to rejoin my family as to see Bhagavan that I went. Perhaps it would be more true to say that I simply felt I had to go there. I entered the ashram hall on the morning of my arrival, before Bhagavan had returned from his daily walk on the hill. I was a little awed to find how small it was, and how close to him I should be sitting. I had expected something grander and less intimate. And then he entered, and to my surprise, there was no great impression, certainly far less than his photographs had made. 
just a white-haired, very gracious man, walking a little stiffly from rheumatism and with a slight stoop. As soon as he eased himself onto the couch, he smiled at me, and then turned to those around and to my young son and said, So Adam's prayer has been answered. His daddy has come back safely. I felt his kindliness, but no more. I appreciated that it was for my sake that he had spoken English since Adam knew Tamil. During the weeks that followed, he was constantly gracious to me, and the strain of nerves and mind gradually relaxed, but there was still no dynamic contact. I was disappointed, as it seemed to show a lack of receptivity in me, and yet, at the same time, it confirmed the opinion I had accepted that he was not a guru and did not give guidance on any path, and Bhagavan said nothing to change my view. It was not until the evening of Kartikai, when each year a beacon is lit on the summit of Arunachala, or it may have been Deepavali, I am not quite sure, when a revelation occurred. There were huge crowds for the festival. I was sitting in the courtyard outside the old hall in front of the couch where Bhagavan was reclining. He sat up, facing me, and his narrowed eyes pierced into me, penetrating, intimate, with an intensity I cannot describe. It was as though they said, You have been told. Why have you not realized? And then, quietness, a depth of peace, an indescribable lightness and happiness. Thereafter, love for Bhagavan began to grow in my heart, and I felt his power and beauty. Next morning, for the first time sitting before him in the hall, I tried to follow his teaching by using Vichara. Who am I? I thought it was I who had decided. I did not, at first, realize that it was the initiation by look that had vitalized me and changed my attitude of mind. Indeed, I had heard only vaguely of this initiation and paid little heed to what I had heard. Only later did I learn that other devotees also had such an experience and that with them also it had marked the beginning of active sadhana under Bhagavan's guidance. My love and devotion to Bhagavan deepened. I went about with a lilt of happiness in my heart feeling the blessing and mystery of the Guru, repeating like a song of love that he was the Guru, the link between heaven and earth, between God and me, between the formless being and my heart. I became aware of the enormous grace of his presence. Even outwardly he was gracious to me, smiling when I entered the hall, signing to me to sit where he could watch me in meditation. And then one day a sudden vivid reminder awoke in me the link with formless being. But he is the formless being. And I began to apprehend the meaning of his jnana and to understand why devotees addressed him simply as Bhagavan, which is a word meaning God. So he began to prove in me what he declared in his teaching, that the outer guru serves to awaken the guru in the heart. The vichara, the constant who am I, began to evoke an awareness of the self as Bhagavan outwardly and also simultaneously of the self within. The specious theory that Bhagavan was not a guru had simply evaporated in the radiance of his grace. Moreover, I now perceived that so far from his teaching not being practical guidance, it was exclusively that I observed that he shunned theoretical explanations and kept turning the questioner to practical considerations of sadhana, of the path to be followed. It was that and that only that he was here to teach. I wrote and explained this to people who had misinformed me and, before sending the letter, showed it to him for his approval. He approved and handed it back, bidding me send it. Daily I sat in the hall before him. I asked no questions, for the theory had long been understood. I spoke to him only very occasionally, about some personal matter. But the silent guidance was continuous, strong and subtle. It may seem strange to modern minds, but the guru taught in silence. 
This did not mean that he was unwilling to explain when asked. Indeed, he would answer sincere questions fully. What it meant was that the real teaching was not the explanation but the silent influence. The alchemy worked in the heart. I strove constantly by way of the bichara according to his instructions. Having a strong sense of duty or obligation, I still continued side by side with it to use other forms of sadhana which I had undertaken before coming to Bhagavan, even though I now found them burdensome and unhelpful. Finally I told Bhagavan of my predicament and asked whether I could abandon them. He assented, explaining that all methods only lead up to the vichara. From the moment of my arrival at Tiruvannamale, there had been no question of my leaving again. This was home, even at the very beginning when I was so mistaken about Bhagavan, even when material prospects seemed bleak. Perhaps that was why Bhagavan, in his graciousness, bestowed the initiation on one who sought but had not the wit to ask. This period of constant physical proximity lasted up to the beginning of 1948. I had never been in a financial position to make me suppose I should be able to spend nearly three years at an ashram, but circumstances adapt themselves to the will of Bhagavan. Not only did His grace keep me there, but it enabled me to go through the long period of unemployment and other trials and bereavement without undue anxiety. Although he never spoke of my difficulties or misfortunes, he flooded my heart with peace. Early in 1948, constant physical proximity had ceased to be necessary, and professional work had become urgently necessary. Work was found in Madras. I took with me a life-size photograph of Bhagavan, painted over in oils a gift from Dr. T. N. Krishnaswamy, a devotee and photographer. I showed it to Bhagavan before leaving, and he took it in his hands and returned it, saying, He is taking Swami with him. Since then it has looked at me with the love and compassion of a guru, and spoken more profoundly than all the other portraits. Thereafter I went to Tiruvannamale only for weekends and holidays, and each visit was revitalizing. I was there at the time of one of the operations that Bhagavan suffered and had darshan immediately after it, and the graciousness of his reception melted the heart and awoke remorse to think how great was the reward for so little effort made. I was there that fateful April night of the body's death and felt a calm beneath the grief and wonder at the fortitude Bhagavan had implanted in his devotees to bear their loss. Gradually, one after another, began to discover in his heart the truth that Bhagavan had not gone away, but as he promised, is still here. Since that day, his presence in the heart has been more vital, the outpouring of grace more abundant, his support more powerful. The grace that emanates from the tomb is the grace of living Ramana. During these years I have felt no urge to write about Bhagavan. After his body's death and his reassurance, I am not going away. I am here. Where could I go? There was a dream in which he called me up to him, and as I knelt before his couch, placed his hands on my head in blessing. At this time an impulse came to write about Bhagavan, and especially to explain the accessibility of the path of self-inquiry which he taught. Arunachala Ramana There is an old saying that the sacred hill of Arunachala is wish-fulfilling. I heard of it first in a remarkable way. I was then a newcomer and was making my first circuit of the hill. A more veteran devotee of Sri Bhagavan was walking beside me and said, You must be careful not to wish for anything while on the hill or walking round it because Arunachala is wish-fulfilling. Anywhere else the saying would have sounded absurd. One would have laughed and said, But surely that is just the reason why I should wish for something. 
but one whose heart has opened to the spirit of Sri Bhagavan's teaching understood. There are modes and levels of spiritual aspiration on which petitions and wishes are justified so long as the petitioner sincerely believes them to be for the good. Even petitions for a change of fortune, making for his mundane happiness or welfare, and far more, petitions of an unselfish nature. But Bhagavan sought, like Buddha, to free us, not so much from our misfortunes, as from the wishes and desires, the fears and attachments which make misfortunes possible. Therefore, to come to him or to Arunachala with the wish was to deny his teaching. It was the path of pure Advaita that he taught, the highest, the most serene. There was no compromise, no half measure. The illusory ego self had to be denied, so how could one ask for boons for it? True, those who responded to the teaching were still enmeshed in hopes and fears, still very far from having dissolved the illusion, but the least they could do was to recognize that the hopes and fears were illusions and strive to put them aside, not ask for help of Bhagavan in indulging them. Described in words, this sounds a hard path and makes Bhagavan appear a hard master, but he was all love. It was his grace that made misfortunes dwindle and took the sting from fear. It was he who bore the burden. It was the magnitude of his love and the serenity permeating the heart in his presence that made desires and afflictions dwindle until to pray for things seemed an unworthy act. The depth of compassion in his eyes at any misfortune would heal the heart of the sufferer. And yet, behind it, was the silent urging to give up attachments to turn from the ever-frustrated ego to the ever-blissful self. It was compassion for suffering, but even more for the ignorance that made suffering possible. It might be suggested that this path of pure understanding was only for the philosophers and intellectuals. Surely the simple folk, rich and poor, who came to Bhagavan, came with prayers and petitions and with wishes to be fulfilled. In any case, they felt the silent flood of grace, peace permeated their hearts, and their attachment to whatever had caused bitterness or anxiety was transmuted into love for Bhagavan. A simple-minded lady said, I don't understand the philosophy, but when he looks at me, I feel just like a child in its mother's arms. A businessman, speaking of miracles, said proudly, my Bhagavan doesn't give a hoot for such things. It was only a little more outward. Those who were not at first drawn to seek the self in the heart were drawn by love to the self manifested as Sri Ramana. And he said, Submission to God, Guru and self is the same and is all that is needed. They felt that he did not wish them to ask for things and his love was so much more precious than any boon they could have asked for that it dissolved the petition and left them poor and open-hearted before him. The old saying that it is sufficient to be born at Tiruvarur or die at Benares or even think of Arunachala refers to the Mount Adiksha, the silent transmission of grace, for which physical presence is not needed. But to think of Arunachala means to turn the destroyer of desires and to renounce all petitions. What then is this wish fulfilling Arunachala? And why did Bhagavan take up his mortal abode there and compose hymns to it? From the most ancient time, Arunachala has been known as Shiva manifested. It is the center of the most pure and quintessential doctrine, the doctrine of Advaita and of the spiritual path that goes with it, the most direct path of all, that of self-inquiry. Arunachala Shiva is the destroyer of otherness in the fire of union. Unite with me to destroy the duality of you and me, and bless me 
with the state of ever-vibrant joy. Bhagavan sang in the great hymn Arunachala Akshara Manavala. It is at Arunachala that Shiva in ancient times taught as Dakshina Murti, that is, as a youth, surrounded by elderly disciples whom he taught in silence. For the direct influence on the heart is the natural counterpart of pure Advaitic doctrine. Just as the doctrine requires no theoretical adumbrations, so the path, based upon it, requires no elaboration of technique. There is a legend that throughout the ages, Dakshinamurti has been sitting beneath a huge banyan tree on the north slope of Arunachala, in a spot inaccessible to climbers, and that his silent upadesa would bring realization to any who approached him. The direct path of self-inquiry has been inaccessible to mankind, and therefore Arunachala has been neglected and considered of less importance than centers of less direct theory and more practicable paths. Now, however, the direct path has been opened to us again by Shiva in the form of Sri Ramana. What was inaccessible has been made accessible. What was hidden high on the hillside has been brought down to the foot of the hill, to the ashram first, and now to the shrine where worshippers sit in silent meditation. That is why Bhagavan declared that Arunachala is the spiritual center of the world, because the path it represents has again become the central mode of man's aspiration. That is why he approved the project that his ashram should still remain a spiritual center when he left the body, because the path still remains open. However, to suggest that Bhagavan chose Arunachala for his abode because it is the traditional center of the direct path he was to teach would be supposing altogether too much deliberation. It was not a rational but a spiritual choice, and it would be more correct to say that Arunachala chose Sri Ramana. Even in childhood, the name fascinated him. When as a schoolboy he met a traveler from Tiruvannamale and learnt that this was Arunachala, it came to him as a shock and a premonition of joy that the sacred hill could actually be visited on earth. When he left home as a sadhu after his self-realization, while still a youth of seventeen, it was in search of his father, Arunachala. It was while standing before the inner shrine of Arunachala on his arrival at the great temple of Tiruvannamale, that the peace in which he was now living became pronounced. For more than fifty years that still remained of his life on earth, he never again left Tiruvannamale, the town or the hill. While he was still a youth in a cave on the hill, some devotees asked him for a devotional hymn to help them in their sadhana. He walked round the hill with them, and as he walked, he composed the supreme hymn, Arunachala Ashkaramanamala, tears streaming from his eyes as he sang it. That last evening, as he lay dying, a group of devotees sat outside the little room singing Arunachala Aksharamanamala. He heard it just before breath left the body, and two tears of bliss trickled down from the outer corners of his eyes. At the moment of death, a large star was seen to trail slowly across the sky to the peak of Arunachala as his spirit returned to the father. That night, while the body he had now relinquished was exposed to the view of the devotees in the great new hall of the ashram, they spontaneously sang the Tamil verse he had made long ago, Arunachala Ramana. The spiritual power of Arunachala has become active again as it was long ago. Dakshina Murti has moved down to the foot of the hill. He said, I am not going away. I am here. He is at Tiruvannamale as before, and at the same time, he is spaceless. He is spaceless Arunachala Ramana, here in the heart of every devotee who turns to him guiding them as before. Bodily presence at Arunachala 
at the shrine at the foot of the hill is not necessary. The silent initiation, as before, can strike where it will. But for those who wear a body, bodily presence remains a great aid. If it were not so, Shiva would not have needed to manifest as Arunachala or Sri Ramana. The grace of Bhagavan radiates from Arunachala and from his shrine there, no less than it did from his bodily form. People are drawn there, as they were to his bodily presence. And just the same, they feel their doubts and questions melting away, and their wishes dissolved in love. Often enough, the grace poured out upon them affects their circumstances in life also, and the inner harmony is reflected outwardly. But to go there for that purpose is to reject the greater good for the lesser. It is in that sense that Arunachala is wish-fulfilling and that it is better not to ask. Ramana Sadguru There was always some mystery about the Upadesa or spiritual guidance of Sri Bhagavan. He did not give diksha or initiation in the usual way of laying on hands or giving the disciple a mantra to repeat. However, that did not mean that he ignored the necessity for initiation. On the contrary, he explicitly stated that a mantra picked up casually would not be effective, but the user must be duly initiated into it by one with authority. It also did not mean that he was unconcerned with the guidance of aspirants. In fact, that was the one thing he was obviously concerned with. He did not approve of questions of theory, ask for mere mental gratification. The questions of sadhana or practice, he always answered fully and graciously. There was no air of indolence at the ashram but an intense activity. One might say the activity of a spiritual factory, with the devotees engaged in sadhana and Bhagavan supervising and guiding each one with meticulous, though silent care. All knew that they were the disciples and he the guru. In private he spoke to them as the guru and sometimes gave instructions for their sadhana. In each case, the sadhana under his guidance dated from some act or word of initiation usually concealed, perhaps like that described in the foreword to this book. When asked whether he was a guru and gave initiation, he always avoided a direct reply. Had the reply been no, he would most certainly have said no. But had he said yes, he would immediately have been besieged by demands for initiation and would have been driven to make a distinction between true devotees, and those who visited him without submitting their heart and seeking his guidance. And his compassionate love was too great and his wisdom too shrewd to act in a way that would lead some to think that he ranked them higher than others. Indeed, he did not, since he saw the self and all. When asked whether he gave initiation, Bhagavan's most usual reply was that there are three types of initiation, by speech, by look, and by silence. This left the burden of understanding upon the inquirer. It is an old tradition, the three types being symbolized by the bird, which needs to sit on its eggs in order to hatch them, the fish, which needs only to look at them, and the tortoise which needs only to think of them. Initiation by silence is most natural to the jnana marga. Some formalists did indeed leave and seek initiation elsewhere, and Bhagavan said nothing to detain them. Those with understanding remained. He said to one of them, Major Chadwick, if it had been necessary for you to seek a guru elsewhere, you would have gone away long ago. He was the Sadguru, the Jivan Mukta, the perfect jnani for whom there are no others but only the self, and therefore no relationship can be postulated. He sometimes reminded his devotees that the outer guru is only a form taken out of consideration for the disciple's ignorance and serves to turn him inward to discover the inner guru, who is the self. 
Normally, spiritual masters have written openly about theory but have been more reserved about the technique they prescribed, lest any should attempt it without due authorization and do themselves harm. Bhagavan, however, proclaimed the path openly in speech and writing. This innovation accords with the silent initiation that he was bringing to the world. On any who turned to him in their heart, the silent initiation might descend, in whatever place they might be, and any such could learn from the books the technique to be used. Indeed, Bhagavan has sometimes reminded devotees that even the journey to Tiruvannamale is only illusory, the real pilgrimage having to be made in the heart, and has referred them to the published accounts of the path to be followed. This leads on to another question, whether the direct path opened by Bhagavan was for his lifetime only or is still open to those who seek. A guru is necessary for every seeker, as Bhagavan himself said. He added, however, that the guru need not necessarily take human form. When he said this, it applied only to a very rare case. But his guidance has made what was true for him, true for his devotees also. His whole work differs from the normal mode of spiritual guidance. Throughout the ages, there have been parallel initiatory streams flowing to the ocean, each within its own banks. But now, at the end of the Kali Yuga, many have petered out in the desert or marshes or dwindled to a trickle. And it is to this state of affairs that Bhagavan has brought the reply with a lifeline thrown out to all who turn to him. If the method is unusual, it is only necessary to remember that it is Bhagavan who is the doer, and then to object would be to make oneself ridiculous. It would be like the Jews who rejected Christ because he did not come in the form they expected. And if Bhagavan could dispense with the usual mode of initiation and guidance during his lifetime, why not afterwards? The conditions which call for the innovation still exist. There are, moreover, positive indications that the guidance still exists. When asked once whether a Jivan Mukta continues to perform any function after physical death, Bhagavan replied that in some cases, it is so. When his physical death was imminent and devotees complained that he was leaving them without guidance, he replied, You attach too much importance to the body, indicating thereby that his discarding it would not put an end to their guidance. In reply to a question by Dr. Masalavala, retired medical officer of Bhopal State, Bhagavan replied as recorded by Devaraja Mudaliar, in Day by Day with Bhagavan. Guru is not the physical form, so the contact will continue even after the physical form of the Guru vanishes. Before his death, he said, They say I am dying, but I am not going away. Where could I go? I am here. This is a simple doctrinal statement, because the Niani is universal. And there is no here or there for him, no coming or going, in the here and now of eternity. But it was always Bhagavan's way to make a doctrinal statement which, together with its universal truth, would answer the particular needs of the devotee. Though we may leave him in our blindness, he cannot leave us, for he is the self. Right up to the end. Bhagavan showed an interest in the continued publication of the books, revising a new edition during the last few weeks of his life, and yet the very purpose of the books was to spread the knowledge of vichara, the path of self-inquiry. And if that was to be no longer accessible, there would be no further need for them. Bhagavan approved a will that was submitted to him, one of whose terms was that the ashram should be maintained as a spiritual center when he was no longer in the body. Whatever the devotees may do, this is Bhagavan's achievement. The center is the radiation of the Guru. His devotees know that he is still the Guru. 
they have felt the continuance of a guidance not only as a potent but as subtle and detailed as before. For those who seek to turn to him, it is best to say as he did to those who question the heart center of which he spoke, that it is not discussion that is needed, but trial. Let them invoke his grace and strive in the way he prescribed and they will find out for themselves whether the grace and guidance of the Guru are forthcoming. That desolate night, when a brilliant star trailed slowly across the sky at the very moment of his leaving the body, there was neither the frantic grief nor the despair that has been expected, but instead all were assuring each other that he was still there. Each one felt in his heart the continued presence. Those whom one had thought would need consolation were able to console others. That whole night the body that Bhagavan had worn and discarded was exposed to the view of the devotees in the ashram hall. There was grief and weeping, but underneath it there was a strange peace that only Bhagavan himself could have implanted. Few had realized how beloved he was in the neighboring town of Tiruvannamalai. But all through the night vast crowds came and passed through the ashram hall in grief and awe to have a last darshan of the now lifeless face. Long processions walked to and from the town singing Arunachala Shiva. In the days that followed, the strong conviction of his continued presence bore up the devotees and held most of them together. A committee of them was formed to run the ashram affairs together with the former Salvadhikari. The silent meditation and the morning and evening chanting of the Vedas continue before the Samadhi of Bhagavan as they did in his bodily presence. Now is then access is for all. Whatever their caste or religion, The spiritual support that comes in sitting before the samadhi is not only as strong, but as sweet and subtle as it was before the bodily presence. To all those who turn to Bhagavan in their hearts, the response is even more immediate, the support more powerful. Not only that, for that is true wherever they may be, but the spiritual revitalization that they used to derive from a visit to Tiruvannamalai still continues, even though the beloved face is hidden. Devotees from the surrounding towns and from distant places still look forward to the possibility of a visit as they did before. Seekers after divine grace and guidance come as in the past. The shrine is a center whose potency is growing, not diminishing and many envy those who beheld the beauty of the bodily form. Bhagavan always bade us seek the inner guru. The love that we bore to the outer guru helped us to do so. And yet, in a way, it impeded. Now he has taken up his abode in our heart. More than ever, we have to discard our impurities in order to discover him, the self the essence of our being, more than ever he assists us to do so. He is the Sadguru who teaches in silence. Dakshinamurti Arunagiri Yogi dwelt on the north slope of the sacred Arunachala hill, ready to give the potent silent Upadesa to any who came. But the spot was inaccessible. Sri Ramana is Dakshinamurti. He has made accessible what was hidden, for now the grace radiates from his samadhi. The direct path that had been withdrawn has been brought back. The body's death has perhaps brought about one change. He always said, ask yourself, who am I? But he also said, submit to me and I will strike down the mind. Now the quest of the self in the heart and submission to Bhagavan in the heart have become the same. The fusion of jnana and bhakti has become more perfect. Who can ever find thee? The eye of the eye art thou, and without eyes thou seest, O Arunachala. From my 
whom thou didst entice me, then stealing into my heart didst draw me gently into thine. Such is thy grace, O Arunachala. I have betrayed thy secret workings. Be not offended. Show me thy grace now openly, O Arunachala. Aksharamanamala, verses 15 and 97 through 98.